out there kind of on the trail too of not only just the biblical giants but the Native American Stargate culture, Stargate understanding, and most importantly, the giants. And the fascinating thing to us was is that as we tracked uh, the giants, their culture, their uh, civilization, their eating habits, and their eating habits, they were cannibals. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, the growly, jolly green giant is not what we're talking about. We met with uh, different Native American elders, uh, and we got a picture that was unusual. Now, they told us they know where the giant bones are, and they wouldn't let us see the giant bones, yet they would talk about the giant society that the, uh, if you will, the medicine men get together and they open up portals, okay? Now, they maintain their opening up portals in our day and age, and that literally the giants tell them what's coming on the scene. In other words, the giants that are somehow held back are giving them uh, information, and these are the people in the giant society that are absolutely as serious as you could even imagine that the giants are going to return soon. Now, that goes along within our second DVD, True Legends, the series, we're, we're at the Unholy Sea. We actually have the pilot on record as flying a dead giant out of Bagram Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. Fast forward, he contacted me, uh, I forget what year it was, but fast forward to just a couple years ago, and the same pilot that flew the dead giant out of uh, Afghanistan was in a bar. I believe it was in New Mexico, and one of those beer bars. And the deal is, is that a Native American came over to him and basically uh, started to speak to him and uh, sang some sort of a, uh, I guess you'd say a tune or, or something, a, a chant or whatever it was. And Alan said that the, the Native American made the statement to him, you have seen giants. The giants are coming back. Hmm. Alan had never seen the guy before in his life and never encountered it. It kind of blew his mind because uh, he said one of his friends went over and sat in the other part of the uh, uh, restaurant bar and this went kind of like, you know, woo-woo on him. But when, when we're talking about this, we're not only after the bones, Derek, you know. Basically, Tim and I are on not only the trail of the giants, but we're going after the live ones also. Mm -hmm. Tim's experience in South America and uh, the travels that he's done, the idea is this. The giants have been kept from contemporary history, relegated to fable and myth in order to take away from uh, not only their significance, but the reality in order to bring them back at a given point in history. Mm. And uh, Tim, you want to address that? Because I think it's pretty uh, important that when you were specifically in Sardinia, this is such a matter of fact issue over there, and especially who do the Sardinians believe they are? And it's pretty important to get this point out, Dirk. Well, according to our research, it seems that many of the Sardin Sardinians are descended directly from the giants, from the Canaanite giants, mm. that either came before or during uh, the conquest of Canaan by the Israelites under Moses and Joshua. There was a, uh, a, a pillar that was reportedly found, and I forgot who wrote this down, but one of the Greek historians, if it was uh, Hesiod or Herodotus, but there was a, a pillar that was found in the Mediterranean, uh, reportedly put up by a group that said, we fled from before the face of Joshua the robber. That's right. Joshua the, son, the robber, son of Nun. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and what I found in the research from my book was that the Amorites, who were driven out of Canaan by the Israelites, believed, apparently, that they were descended from the Titans. That's right. Yeah, and, and uh, it seems to us, and this is astounding, that Sardinia, the island of Sardinia, and for those who don't know, the island of Sardinia is off the western coast of Italy, of mainland Italy. It is a part of Italy. It's a district of Italy. It's below Corsica. And uh, the island of Sardinia seems to be ground zero for those giants, for the Canaanite giants, that they came and they... Uh, they came together on this island. They did something very unique, the Nuragic culture. Uh, it's called the Nuragic culture in Sardinia. It's a very unique ancient culture. Nobody really knows much about it. We believe it has Canaanite roots. We believe that the root of that culture, of the, uh, of the native culture of Sardinia, is the culture of the Rephaim, is the culture of the giants mm -hmm. from Canaan. Right. And uh, what's astounding 
is that all over Sardinia there's very unique architecture uh, that is only found in a couple of other places um, but in, in very small quantities, whereas in Sardinia there, are over, there were over 30,000 megalithic towers on the island of Sardinia alone. And each one of these megalithic towers would have taken a massive amount of energy and time to build and resources. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would have taken a strong, powerful civilization to build 30,000 stone megalithic towers. Well, Sardinia is not of that things, big a place. No, it's a, it's a relatively small. It's actually a quite, it's a, it's a large island. But, I mean, compared to mainland Italy or, or some other country, right. yeah, it's relatively small. So, on one island alone, and uniquely on this island, over 30,000 megalithic towers were raised by some unknown race uh, who, who we call the Neurogic Civilization, who historians call the Neurogic Civilization. And uh, what's really intriguing about that is that associated with these towers are what are called and have been called for generations the tombs of the giants. And the tombs of the giants are megalithic tombs. Wherever you find Nuragi Towers, you find the tombs of the giants. Hmm. And we have documented and we have interviewed people in Sardinia uh, who've, who've gone on the record talking about not only the tombs of the giants, but the, the bodies of the giants that were once inside those tombs. Hmm. And we're talking anywhere from 9 to 15 feet tall, uh, uh, giants of that stature. And thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of giants were buried on the island of Sardinia. And mm. as I said, the, uh, the people of Sardinia to this day, um, many of them, according to their legends, claim to be descended from the giants. In fact, our main contact in Sardinia, uh, who's in our film, his father came from a tribe that, that, the, uh, that the Sardinians called the giants. They were actually called, this tribe was called the giants. His, his father was over seven feet tall. His grandfather was over eight feet tall. Hmm. And this was common in this lineage in Sardinia. So what we think we've stumbled upon here is literally ground zero for the post-flood giants. Hmm. A stronghold of giants on the island of Sardinia. A holocaust of giants because there's possibly tens of thousands of dead giants in the soil still to this day in the soils of Sardinia. And it's really an incredible, uh, it's really an incredible cover-up that's happened there. And it relates to what was happening in the United States in terms of the Smithsonian cover-up and the, and the giants that were once in the United States, as you guys alluded to. Uh, that, the, the, the kind of cover-up that was happening in the United States in the early 1900s, late... Uh, uh, and 19, all through the 19th century. And all through yeah. the 19th century, um, is still happening to this day hmm. on the island of Sardinia. Hmm. One of the things that we know about the giants is that the early church fathers and even the Greek historians believed that demons progressed from the spirits of those men of renown who lived prior to the flood. What's the connection between the uh, spirits of those giants and demonic activity today, and perhaps the uh, spirits that the, uh, the society of giants among the Native Americans are contacting today? Tim, just before the break, we're talking about uh, what you call the Holocaust of Giants. Of course, we know from the biblical and uh, extra biblical accounts like the book of Enoch, the book of Yasher, uh, that the giants who were in the land in the days of Noah were destroyed. Uh, when did these giants who were buried in Sardinia die and, d and how much demonic activity, spiritual activity do you find on Sardinia? Is there any link between that as a hot spot for giants and a hot spot for demonic activity? Well, it is. Um, if you look at the, some of the customs of the neurogic culture, what you discover is the rudiments of Phoenician culture, of Canaanite culture. Hmm. So you have the, a lot of the uh, uh, Molech motifs all over Sardinia and their little figurines, um, the little statuettes that they discover all the time inside of the tombs of the giants, inside of the Nuragi Towers. Uh, so there's a lot of, there's, there's a very strong Sumerian Middle Eastern influence on the island, which is very strange in the Mediterranean, especially considering that the only known ziggurat ever discovered in the Mediterranean is in Sardinia. Really? So uh, it's called Monte de, de Codi. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a ziggurat in the style uh, of the Sumerian ziggurats and, and those that were found throughout the Middle East. Right, which kind of preceded the... Uh, the uh, they, they look sort of like primitive pyramids, but they are older. The ziggurats are older than the Egyptian pyramids. Yeah, and, they, and these, and these um, 
this per this ziggurat on the island of Sardinia basically solidifies the idea that there was some kind of a Middle Eastern influence happening uniquely mm -hmm. on the island of Sardinia. All the towers, the tombs of the giants, I think it's safe to assume, and I think people are going to be drawing the same conclusion after watching our film, that the Canaanite giants were in, were, had a stronghold on the island of Sardinia. Hmm. What's interesting, too, on the neurogic culture, that you even see that in some of the Pueblo designs, like at Chaco Canyon, you see it in the observatories. That's what a lot of people are losing track of. You know, in essence, when Joshua and Caleb went into the Promised Land and drove out the giants, I think word spread really fast, even faster than gossip on the Internet, okay? Mm -hmm. So that basically they had to flee for their life. And you said something. I want to deal with the demonism in this because demons are called lying spirits in the Bible. They're the disembodied spirit, you know, from the Greek word daimonizimai. Uh, to be, they, they had to have been embodied before they're disembodied. What's fascinating now, Derek, is all of the... Uh, overwhelming stories that are on the world newspapers and even the Smithsonian, you'll find this interesting, they who have done more to cover up the existence of giants are now basically heralding the virtues of cannibalism. Now cannibalism is interesting. It comes from basically the worship of Baal by the Canaanites who demanded human sacrifice. And somebody said, well, where is, why is this important? Because it's the spirit that's been loosed. Over the years I've been on talk radio, a lot of people have contacted me from all the different, uh, I would say this, the spook world, black ops, that just simply means stuff that most people don't know exists. But there is an overwhelming quest. There's an overwhelming uh, uh, amount of effort being put in to find basically old relics, extractable DNA, i.e., can you imagine a mummy from, uh, you know, 18 feet tall? And some of the people that were involved in the original extraction, the mummies from the Grand Canyon, those were taken to Area 51, hmm. okay? Uh, that's the nice benefit. And, you, the, you know, Tim and I and anybody who's out there researching, you've got to withhold certain bits of information to basically break the feedback loop of coming back to you. But what's really important is, is that the criticisms against Sardinia having giants, and I want to share this, right now the biggest, most well-funded uh, documentary by James Cameron, obviously the director of the Titanic, right. Avatar, I want you to remember this, Terminator, uh, the only man to go down into the Mariana Trench, the deepest point in the Pacific Ocean, who is putting his bucks, big bucks, into the search for Atlantis. The key to Atlantis starts in Sardinia. Even though they started there, they don't get it. Mm -hmm. the, the fascinating, uh, if you will, the genetic tracing, tracking, and I've said this before, and I think you've heard me say this, I've said it a lot of times, but the Human Genome Project was not so much about the human genome, but it was identifying the genes or the genetic markers of the giants, okay? The appetites of demons always express themselves in human sacrifice. Now we've got the biggest, uh, I would say, soon to break uh, story, the pedogate, yep. all of the uh, cannibalism of the little, of the, the wonderful little children, you know, mm. and the sickness that's out there. That's the spirit that's been loosed. So from the time that, you know, we're, we're dealing with, even we were all at Tom and our film crew, by the way, we had a film crew there too, you know, with, uh, with everybody in the desert southwest. And what was fascinating, even though the Native Americans knew that these giants were basically destroying them, eating them, uh, Tom has talked about the Sand Canyon, uh, the giants literally, the, the Anasaze, the ancient ones, the alien ones, were running for their lives, and they were literally lunch on the hoof, okay, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. lunch on the foot. So there was always a denial in, in I would say this, the denial by ethnographers, uh, by anthropologists, that there was any cannibals in the United States has now been put f just to total rest. The burial mounds, and they, they call them the Adena and the Hopewell. We can trace all of those to basically South America, Mesoamerica, Latin America, now, you know. And what's important that people understand is this, is that even in Texas, the Car uh, uh, some people pronounce it Karnakawa, the other people pronounce it Karankawa, but the, the appetite of demons was always expressed 
through these cultures, you know, and so it wasn't just ritualism, can, ritual cannibalism, it was full scale, you know, uh, what's for lunch. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fascinating that now we're, we're coming full circle. And, you know, that's pretty hard for most people. That's the ultimate taboo. But now we're seeing it in, in the headlines, just as Tim was talking about the Canaanites. And by the way, there are three great books that people want to know about the Canaanite and the Philistines in America. America BC, Bronze Age America, and Saga America by a Harvard uh, anthropologist, ethnographer named Barry Fell. Okay? Right, right. So, so it's impossible to say they never came here. And so the Egyptian presence, that's kind of what, what that we've got. With every single uh, monument in the Grand Canyon had an Egyptian name. We were in the Valley of the Giants, okay? How did that get its name? Well, beyond the Navajo legend that these are great warriors frozen in time, it goes way back. The fact that Apaches have been found, the Apaches have been found with uh, Egyptian genetic markers. Really? The story is that Alexander Helios, you know, uh, the son of Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, mm -hmm. history basically just doesn't record where he went to. The, the stuff we're digging up uh, indicates that they, they came to the Grand Canyon, 50,000 strong, okay? Now remember, the water level, we're talking, you know, a couple thousand years ago, mm -hmm. and the water level was much higher, just like you can look at, uh, oh, good night, we were at uh, Lake Powell, and you can see the bathtub ring, and it's down, down, down. That's an artificial lake, but the Grand Canyon wasn't. So what's fascinating is this, is that the rock formations that are in the Grand Canyon and other places in desert southwest, even the different kivas, all line up with the heavens, okay? And what we have done, and, and Tim and the film crew have done, is in Sardinia, I, I believe they've found, if you will, the origin of the dispersion, the dis, what did they call it, the, dis, the, the diaspora of the giants even to the Americas. Mm. And a, again, you cannot separate the neurogic culture slash architecture slash giants, and then you see it repeated in the desert southwest. We will prove that to beyond any doubt. And here's what, again, uh, the bottom line is. You know I like to get there. We should have started with that statement at the beginning. <laughs> the bottom line is, is that you cannot doubt, number one, the presence of giants. Number two, people yeah. try and, uh, you know, say, oh, those aren't giant graves. They don't understand. The giants are buried under the underground. And I told Tim, I said, Tim, I want the helicopter shot. Where they went, it was like, you know, you got these guys and, you know, little uh, spies, okay? And then when they've got a helicopter, as they get closer to the current excavation of giants, guess who's the eye in the sky, you know? And uh, so what we're trying to say is people are doing everything they can to cover this up until the time of their release, when they can spin all the history to their advantage, as Tom has done in, you know, Exo Vatican and all the stuff you're doing. And, and I think it's really important. Tim, go ahead and take the... Well, I think it's interesting that, uh, you know, Steve was talking about the giants uh, maybe migrating out of Sardinia and going all over the place, because one thing we know about the neurogic civilization is they were uh, adept sailors. Yeah. And they built these large boats that were Phoenician, basically. They were just like, the, they were the fin part of the Phoenicians, a branch of the Phoenicians. And so they did sail all over the world. We know that's a fact. Even the uh, uh, conventional historians and archaeologists admit that. Well, exactly. And that's something I stumbled across in my research, that the Egyptians, the, uh, it, it, all the way through the Persian period, from 4,000 uh, years ago to uh, you know, 500 years before Jesus, whenever they needed a navy, they'd contact the Phoenicians or the Canaanites and basically yep. hire them out as a contract navy. Yep. And, uh, In fact, the Egyptians hired the Chardon, what they, they call the people, the Chardon from right. uh, Sardinia. We know, we know that they hired the Chardon because they have, they're in their hieroglyphs. Right. So the Egyptians were even, and among these people in Sardinia, just like in Canaan, among the regular sized people was the giant class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's fascinating stuff, and it's not part of the uh, standard history, but as we pick apart these threads, uh, and as Steve mentioned, uh, we're coming at this from different angles, but uh, they're, they're out there in the field. I'm just digging my nose into articles and, and you know, books, uh, but they're out there doing the hard work and coming up with a fascinating documentary film. This will be out mid-May? Mid-May. Mid-May. Uh, True Legends, Episode 3, There Were Giants. Uh, Steve Quayle, Timothy Alberino, we're going to continue this conversation next week. I want to get more into the spiritual stuff uh, and what these uh, Indian elders, the Society of Giants, what they're hearing from what may well be the spirits of giants through these portals. So gentlemen, we appreciate it and we thank you for watching as we keep watch. I'm Derek Gilbert and this is Skywatch TV.
The right of incubation pertains to, to the island of Sardinia. Okay. Um, on the island of Sardinia, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of sepulchres called the tombs of the giants. That's what they're called. They okay. have been called for many an age. The, the tombs of the giants are very large megalithic graves. And they're, they're very long. Some of them are 30 feet long and um, 4 feet wide and so forth. And there's a great contention surrounding the tombs of the giants because uh, there's a lot of what I call keyboard ar archaeologists out there who see pictures of the tombs <laughs> of the giants online or, or see little documentaries that have been done in Sardinia. And they scoff and they say, oh, that's just a legend. You Giants can't really fit in the tombs. Th those tombs could not house the body of a giant. They're too thin or whatever. Well, number one, giants could fit in the tombs. I went there with a tape measure, something they didn't do. Yeah, I went yeah. there with a tape Original measure. Original research. Yeah. yeah. And so, yes, giants could fit in the tombs. But it turns out that contention is totally irrelevant. Why? Because the giants were not put in the tombs. They were buried beneath them. And why were they buried beneath them? Because of something called the rite of incubation, hmm. which is a ceremony that was practiced by the neurogic culture, uh, was practiced by the ancient Sardinians, who we believe were Canaanites, um, uh, in which the young people during a rite of passage ceremony would go into the tombs, what they call it the gallery inside of these, are megalithic tombs inside of the gallery, and they would spend the night by themselves inside of the gallery. My, uh, the, the doorways are very small in these tombs and people have said why would they put giant bodies in there the doorways are so small they can't fit body blah 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 because they don't understand that the doorways were big enough for the young people to get down in they were probably sealed in there and they spent definitely a night if not an extended period of time in the tomb alone what were they there for the rite of incubation to absorb the spirit of the mighty ones that were buried Beneath this it's, reminds me a lot of Aleister Crowley going and spending a night inside the Great Pyramid at Giza that's for right. the same purpose. It's the same kind of idea. Exactly. The giants were buried beneath the tombs, not within them, beneath, beneath them, and the young people would go in. That is called incubation. The idea is to absorb the prowess, the power, the spirit, possibly in a very literal sense, in, in, in a demonic possession. Yeah. In the, in the sense of a demonic possession, absorbing the spirits of the giants that were buried beneath them. Now, that is the tradition in Sardinia, which gets overlooked by so many, again, keyboard archaeologists that don't understand. They didn't go to do the research to find out mm -hmm. that that's what the tombs are for. They're there for the rite of incubation. And we're talking hundreds, if not thousands, mm. of tombs of the giants in Sardinia. So um, were they going in there and getting totally demon-possessed? That's one question. The, the answer is probably most definitely yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> but then the second question is this, and this is a question that, that we, we, we talk about all of this in our film, by the way. We go from the desert southwest in the United States to the island of Sardinia, and we show you how these things connect. And the real question that, that I think we find the most provocative about the tombs of the giants is this. Are there still giants alive in a state of stasis or suspended animation in the soils of Sardinia or in the underground caverns or beneath the tombs of the giants. And the reason why I ask that question is because of a very interesting quote from Aristotle in his book Physics, mm -hmm. in which he said, he's talking about the time, he's talking about the property of time and the passing of time is not like, it's not like traveling from one location to another where you can obviously tell that you've, you've moved, you have, you have uh, moved a distance, you're in a new environment. Time isn't like that he's talking about and he uses a reference to his audience, to the, to the Greek audience of the time, mm -hmm. um, he uses this, this, he uses the island of Sardinia as a reference. And those who sleep with the mighty ones that are buried in Sardinia, when they arise, they don't realize how much time has passed. So what is Aristotle saying here? We know that the mighty ones is a term that's always been used of the giants. The Bible calls them the gibberim, the mighty ones, the mighty men, the heroes. All of this Canaanite terminology for giants is in Sardinia. Mm -hmm. And so the rite of incubation, these young people go into the tombs to absorb the spirit of the heroes, the mighty ones, the giants that were buried beneath. And there's this question that we deal with in our film. Are there giants still in, st in stasis to this day? beneath the ground. And we have other reasons to believe that there very well may be. Aristotle is suggesting that these entities arise. And when they arise, 
they don't realize how much time has passed. So we're not talking about entities that were asleep overnight. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, some very interesting clues in the ancient texts and, and in the archaeological ruins in Sardinia that are leading us to some very, very provocative conclusions. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the interesting scriptures about this, too, is when, when it's stated, uh, shall the dead rise to praise thee, okay? Well, the dead is Rapha, from mm -hmm. which we get the word Raphaim. And right. whenever you see the Aim, you know that you're talking about something that's not a human being. You know, I am is different than NG. And what's important to recognize that the same thing that's going on in Sardinia, the rite of passage, is taking place in the desert southwest. Uh, they called it a vision quest, but many times in the kivas, they would sit in the kivas, they'd go into altered states, and they'd try and call up the entities. Mm -hmm. Now, to those, now, what are the kivas for people who aren't familiar with that term? Well, a kiva is like literally a circular temple, okay, with a doorway at the bottom. And they usually sit in a round or a semicircular uh, seating pattern, and these entities come through the come through the circular door. And Tom Horn interviewed, inter, excuse me, Tom Horn interviewed uh, Dr. Mose, mm -hmm. you know, and and he went into great detail on that. But let me tell you, excuse me, for the UFO community, how this fits in. People just dismiss that out of hand, but Phil Schneider, who you can look it up, uh, was murdered because he went uh, broke, I guess you'd say, broke the news on what went on in Dulce, the base. By the way, when we were down in the, the desert southwest, we were, how far were we from Dulce to the east of us? Oh, we were not very far. We were not very far and got some interesting things on cameras wee early in the morning. But Dulce, the story goes, is an alien base, and it's an incubatorium, okay? Now, the word incubation and incubus are interesting because incubus is basically the root word for incubation, and that means a spirit that can take physical form and can basically, uh, you know, um, have sexual relations with a, with a woman, and a succubus is the female version with a man. Mm -hmm. But given the idea that even in Dulce, New Mexico, that there was a war between the giants and stasis. Now, here's what's interesting, Derek. Tim and I are on record, and we go on great deal detail to make sure, or want to go into great detail to make sure people understand. It's not what you see above, it's what you see below. Now, that's not just a new age statement. The finds in the Giza Plateau are phenomenal, but it's under the Giza Plateau. You'll find ancient civilizations build, build, build on each other. And interestingly enough, the giants in Sardinia were laid on top of each other like cordwood, you know, vertically, horizontally. Mm -hmm. vertically. Mm -hmm. And so Tim and I, we go down to Billings, Montana, and we interview a 19, what, a 90-year-old man or 93 something? 93 years 93 old, 93 years old. And he was talking about a paleontologist that was, uh, you know, Montana's known for dinosaur eggs, dinosaurs, all that stuff. I mean, you know, we were in Inland Sea. But talked to us, and he told us that, according to the paleontologist, the giants, the, and here's how it goes, the kingly class, the big guys, are north and south, and the, I guess you'd say, surf class or whatever uh, subclass are east and west. And the parallels between the... Uh, burial habits in even Billings, Montana, which, by the way, we have a lot of Native American tribes there. The jumping forward now, or jumping back, forgive me, trying to stay linear, jumping back to Dulce, the, the giants, even in a form of stasis, have such a, a, and again, it's supernatural. Here's what people try and do. They try and take a natural understanding of the giants and say, well, they can't do this because their lungs aren't big enough. Um, baloney, okay? Uh, baloney with cheese. The idea is, is that they are a supernat they have a supernatural life force given to them by their fallen angel fathers. Mm -hmm. And even in stasis suspended animation, there are multiple, multiple reports of people literally, you know, coming to such and when I say real attack, an electromagnetic emanation, you know, from these entities that they feel like their head are, heads are going to blow up. I literally went on record and actually was contacted by General, sent me proof, you know, I mean, he sent me the proof of who he was, uh, and talking about the Dulce event that happened, and literally scientists not recognizing there's a safe zone. No offense, they call it the red line. And when those guys went past that, even though the giants were in stasis, you know, 
they basically had the worst encounter of their life. They died. Now go all the way to Tibet, and one of the most famous Russian uh, eye doctors, uh, Moldeshev, had the same experience in when the monks took him into a cave and said, but you cannot go beyond this. Well, you know, a medical doctor saying, well, these guys are just superstitious. And he just barely got to the, you know, no-go line, you know, mm -hmm. and not a goal line, but a no-go line. And he said it was like his head was going to explode. So the rite of incubation, whether it's taking place in the desert southwest, the circular, and we, we found, you know, in Sardinia, in Malta, the desert southwest, all over the world, when you see a spiral, okay, uh, you know, some Native Americans say it's not a stargate, but based on where they uh, appear around the world and the legends associated with them, that's their way. How would you draw a stargate? Well, the old time tunnel, you mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm. the infinity. By the way, does everyone remember the Norway the spiral, Norway spiral yeah. and all the other spiral effects taking place? So when when Jesus said the gates of hell, you know, you know that his church, you know, but the gates of hell will not prevail. You know, it doesn't mean they're not going to open or try. And now you've got a you've got a naturalistic, scientifically ignorant society having believed the lies of that establishment, unable to deal with the supernatural nature of the evil. So again, Sardinia is, and we'll talk about this uh, probably tomorrow, but it, Sardinia is the Rosetta Stone for being able to understand the dispersion of the giants, of the culture, of the architecture, and it, it, whether people want to believe it or not, the pyramids in the United States and Wisconsin, all over the country, there are pyramids. Cahokia Mounds, just Cahokia east of St. Louis, Mounds, across you know, the river from St. And, Louis. And the deal is, is that, uh, you know, whenever those things are excavated, I've literally had listeners <clears throat> of mine in Ohio, interestingly enough, not Cleveland, some other part of Ohio. <laughs> Tim's from Cleveland. That's where I'm from. Yeah. The, uh, you know, call me and say, the minute they dug up the bones, they made the statement to their uh, postmaster, and the FBI showed up within hours. You know, and trust me, they weren't as understanding as the X-Files, Fox and Mulder, you know. <laughs> and every time mm. we find uh, the giants, we always find, pun intended, the cover-up and the cover-over, you know. But now it's like God, and I believe this, is uncovering this because... Christians are going to be confronted with things they've never been confronted before. I remember writing the book Genetic Armageddon and people, you know, today's technology, tomorrow's monsters. And you guys probably remember those days, but that was a long time ago, you know, and uh, people just couldn't handle it. Now, you know, it's a chimera a day. Some people pronounce it chimera. Mm -hmm. But uh, what's the newest aberration that these scientists can distort the image of God? So, you know, what we're finding right now, okay, is literally the expectation of all these people is that the giants are coming back. And that's, you asked me, in the desert southwest, what are they telling the people? That the giants are coming back. Mm. You know, and, and this is where we're at. Well, we'll talk about that as we uh, continue on, on this discussion. Uh, w one of the things that, again, as we're finding it, making connections in my head with stuff that I researched from my recent book, one of the the main pagan gods of the ancient Near East from about 1000 BC, the time of King David, until just after the time of Jesus was a god called Melkart. Mm -hmm. He came from the Phoenician city of Tyre mm -hmm. and was spread throughout the ancient Near East. Carthage, the, uh, the famous general Hannibal, who gave the Romans all they could handle, was a devout worshiper of Melkart. Melkart was just the Phoenician name of Hercules, who was a demigod, the mm -hmm. son of one of the gods and an immortal woman. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Greek historian Herodotus said that he visited the tomb of Melkart, Hercules, entire. So it all fits together when you know what you're looking for. In about five minutes that we've got left, uh, let's talk about what the uh, Native American elders, these uh, medicine men, are hearing and how they are hearing from these spirits. What are they hearing and how are they getting the messages? Go ahead, Tim. Well, we talked to, uh, we met with some Pueblo Indian uh, elders and uh, they told us some very astounding things. Unfortunately, they wouldn't let us put them on camera saying a lot of these things, but they told us private, privately some very interesting things that uh, they've, according to them, they've never told uh, any other white men before. Mm. And one of the things that they told us, both myself, Steve, and Tom Horn, we were all sitting there together as they told us this story, this is in our film, uh, was about the activation of stargates, the routine activation, activation routine. routine activation of stargates. They described them in great detail to us, 
And in fact, one of them was telling us about it, and the other ones were basically telling him, you shouldn't be telling them this stuff. And he said, well, I'm, what was he, 70 some years old? He doesn't care anymore. Yeah. So he's, he's I, telling I, By the way, I love that guy. Yeah. <laughs> I love you. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, he's telling us about this, uh, these Stargates and, and the activation of the Stargates and describing what was a very, uh, was some kind of a technological thing that they were accessing. It wasn't just like uh, uh, they were all drinking uh, some kind of in intoxicant. Ayahuasca in or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, they were activating some kind of technology. And uh, they were describing it in great deal detail to us and even, even almost telling us the exact locations where some of these Stargates are. Hmm. And so it was, uh, it was a very uh, compelling moment for us. And, and they actually... Uh, they, they probably, you know, told us more than they would have liked. But uh, we talk about this in the film. And that was that was pretty astounding to me to hear these guys, all of them, every single yes. one of them at the table confirm. And all of us heard it. So it's not just, you know, well, Tim, did you hear that? No, did you hear that? I mean, we all heard it. I, you know, I drilled them, too, okay? I, I mean, when I say drilled them, I really wanted them to take us. You know, and I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what would this guy like, a new... Ford truck or a new Chevy truck? I didn't go that far. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, literally, they, they it, and, and here's the deal, Derek. They know their legends that that which they uh, worshipped, uh, uh, and they worship them, okay, destroyed them. And I asked that question, you know, why do you guys worship mm -hmm. that? And it, it's because, listen, here's what we learned down there. If it's supernatural, in their minds, it's good, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's, is that a fair yes, statement, Tim? Yeah, and, and go they, ahead. Mm. They, yeah, they, they have a very... Um, uh, I want to be kind. Uh, the Native American people don't realize the entities that they're dealing with. And uh, just like many of the indigenous peoples around the earth, mm -hmm. um, there's... Well, sadly, we also see this in some of the hyper-charismatic movement inside the Christian that's church true here as in well. the United yeah, States. That's so. true as well. And they're dealing with entities that, uh, that have the appearance of benevolence, but in truth, they're very ancient, very evil entities uh, that are very good at deceiving the human race. Even Satan can appear as a, an angel of light. That's right. Yeah, and when you look at the biblical descriptions of the, the angels, uh, the Nakash in the garden, uh, the seraph, uh, there, there's a constant theme of, uh, of shining or, or, or uh, brilliant, mm -hmm. uh, you know, right. blazing. You know, seraphim right. means Well, that's uh, where Lucifer ones. even so, got his name, you sure, know, the light shining. Bringer. Yep, and, and the, the thing that's interesting, too, is that uh, in, probably in the next show, we need to talk about the Arch of Baal or Baal mm -hmm. and the world leaders gathering under it. And then you put it into the context of WikiLeaks, you put it in the context of human sacrifice. And when you've got the world leaders worshiping, and some people pronounce it Baal, you know, and uh, There's just, only the scholars. The, yeah, 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 well, okay. You know, <laughs> us country folk, Daryl, we, 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 just, we just do it our way. No, the point <laughs> being is, is that, that that is so critical because, again, remember, the Anubis statue was traveling across the country. That's right. And then now what are we dealing with? We're dealing with Egyptian mythology. We're dealing with Babylonian mythology. We're dealing with Sumerian mythology. We're dealing with Native American mythology. Mm -hmm. We're dealing, and guess what? Those guys... All together, I mean, the mainstream media can't even come up with one kernel of truth, and we're presenting a, an entire harvest of truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that will be a fascinating conversation because, again, there's more stuff that dovetails with the stuff that I turned up. And, again, secular scholars have known a lot of this information. Mm -hmm. It's just they're not putting the pieces together right. because they're not viewing it through a spiritual and especially not a biblical lens. Right.